Hello students, today we will be discussing the current affairs for the 14th of March uh, 2022. Now some of the topics that we will be discussing today will are the COVID-19 vaccination which has been allowed for children in the age group of 12 to 14 years. Okay, uh, then most of the other topics are very static topics like the International Criminal Code, the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India and the UDC report which has been released by the Ministry of Education and the Nutraceuticals. The one other topic that we can discuss a little bit about in detail is the Dandi March. Uh, because it is the 75th uh, year of independence, uh, the government is planning to enact out a Dandi March uh, scenario again. Now, moving on. The first topic that we'll discuss we'll discuss for today is the COVID-19 vaccination, which has been allowed for children in the age group of 12 to 14 years. Now, why is it in the news? The Union Health Ministry has decided to start COVID-19 vaccination for those in the 12 to 14 age group from March 16th onwards. The vaccination will be Corbivax, which is manufactured by Biological E. And those above 14 years, are already being administered COVID-19 vaccines. The other vaccines which are around, they are being administered to all those people who are over the age of 14 years. The ministry has also decided that the condition of comorbidity for COVID-19 precaution dose for the population aged over 60 will be removed. Okay, till now, uh, the government was giving this booster dose or the precaution dose, like what the government uh, calls it, only for those population which was aged over 60 years for those people with comorbidities okay so now this precaution dose is being uh, can be given to the this particular criterion has been relaxed it can be given to other people as well now over here in this infograph we have uh, shown as to the different type of uh, vaccines that exist such as the live attenuated vaccine the inactivated uh, virus vaccine the subunit vaccine the dna rna vaccine pfizer and moderna are dna rna vaccines okay so please go through these uh, infographs to understand a little bit more we will discuss whatever these types of vaccines are better over here now now what is corbivax the vaccine which is going to be administered to children between the age group of 12 to 14 years. It's a recombinant protein subunit vaccine. We had seen that over here. It's a subunit vaccine. One part of the antigen is taken and then it is used. Which means that it is made up of a specific part of the SARS-CoV-2. That is the spike part. Hence the spike part of the protein, uh, the spike part of the antigen of the COVID virus is taken and the spike part is used to generate antibodies which are a natural response of the human body to combat any viruses. Hence once this spike protein is introduced into our bodies, WBCs are produced in order to fight these foreign antigens. Now, the spike protein allows the virus to enter into the cells in the body so that it can repli replicate and cause the disease. However, when this protein alone is given to the body, it is not expected to be as harmful as compared to when the full virus is uh, given. Okay, that is the reason only the spike protein is being sent in. So that whenever the spike protein tries to enter into the cells, what does it do? It, it evokes a response of antibodies such as the WBCs. The B cells of the WBCs are created in response to this foreign object which is entering into the human body. The body is expected to develop an immune response against the injected spike protein. Therefore, when the real virus the full virus attempts to infect the body, it will already have an immune response ready that will make it unlikely for the person to fall ill because we are using only a small part of the virus and not the full virus. Okay, now what are the different types of vaccines that are there? Okay, we have viral vector and mRNA vaccines, 
and then we have live attenuated vaccines then we have inactivated virus vaccines and we also have subunit vaccines like what we discussed about now this subunit can be anything and based on those different different subunits you have different different uh, types of vaccines like say for example okay when we're talking about viral vector and mrna vaccines these use a particular code to induce our cells to make the spike proteins against which the body has to build immunity okay now in the case of mrna vaccines they work by using mrna which is the messenger rna which is the molecule that essentially puts dna instructions into actions inside a cell mrna is used as a template to build protein how okay so this mrna is nothing but the genetic material and it gives instructions to ribosomes to build a particular protein in this case it could be the spike protein now based on this mrna the spike protein is being produced within the cells itself and once this spike protein is produced it results in an immune response from the body it results in an immune response in the form of say b cells b cells of wbcs white blood cells okay now when it comes to viral vector vaccines viral vector vaccines use a safe virus to deliver specific sub parts called the proteins of the germ so that it can trigger an immune response without causing the disease to do this the instructions for making particular parts of the pathogen are inserted into a safe virus the safe virus then serves as a platform or vector to deliver the protein into the body the protein triggers the immune response it's the same thing however over here in this particular case you are using a safe virus in order to deliver specific sub parts or proteins such as the spike protein and hence it will be weaker why because you have a safe virus and within that safe virus you have the a dangerous spike protein and hence this can also trigger an immune response so these are the different types then you have live attenuated vaccine a live attenuated vaccine is nothing but it is a living virus unlike in the case of mrna vaccines you are not sending the genetic code or oh, here you are actually sending the actual virus however this actual virus is a weakened form of the germ that causes a disease and because it is a weakened form of the virus it cannot cause any severe damage and it will still result in uh, antibodies being produced and immune response being produced because these vaccines are so similar to the natural infection that they help prevent they create a strong and long lasting immune response the limitation of this approach is that these vaccines usually cannot be given to people with weakened immune systems please remember this this is very important in case it is given to people with weak immune systems what will happen even this live or weakened vaccine can be strong enough to produce a proper disease in the person and it can result in death and hence live and attenuated vaccines can be dangerous next inactivated vaccines now how are they different from live attenuated in live attenuated the virus uh, or the antigen is just weakened whereas in inactivated vaccines the first way to make a vaccine is to take the disease carrying virus or bacteria and inactivate it or kill it using chemicals heat or radiation okay this approach uses technology that has been proven to work in people this is the way the flu and the polio vaccines are made and the vaccines can be manufactured on a reasonable scale and hence over here that is the only difference that over here the virus is killed rather than weakened okay however it requires special laboratory facilities to grow the virus or bacteria safely and can have a relatively long production time and will likely require two or three doses to be administered this is the only drawback like how over here it is the drawback is that it can't be given to people with weak immune systems over here this requires special laboratory facilities to grow the bacteria and it can also have a long production time okay now moving on 
subunit vaccines. It uses only a small part of the vaccine. Unlike weakening or killing of the virus, it rather uses a small part of the vaccine directly. You directly use that small part. Take that small part of the vaccine and use it. Like a spike, it's taken and it is used. Uses the very specific parts or subunits of a virus or bacterium that the immune system needs to recognize. It does not contain the whole microbe or use a safe virus as a vector. Unlike in the case of viral vector vaccines. Okay, a viral vector vaccine uses a safe virus. The subunits may be proteins or sugars or anything. Okay. Uh, it So, this particular method, it reduces the chances of any side effects. However, it also means that the immune response may be weaker in this. The immune response, it might not be as strong as in the case of a weakened vaccine or a live attenuated vaccine. Hence, subunit vaccines might have very weak immune response. Uh, it also reduces this uh, side effects completely. Okay. Now, moving on. I hope uh, we have discussed all the vaccines in detail. Hence, moving on. International Criminal Court. Now, why is it in news? Hamid Mounting calls to prosecute Russian President Vladimir Putin. The International Criminal Court earlier this month launched an investigation into alleged war crimes committed following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Now, now, what is the difference between the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court? Okay, now, the International Court of Justice is the official court of the UN and it is known as the World's Court. However, the International Criminal Court is not under the UN system. It is just related to the UN and it may be referred to uh, for cases by the UN Security Council. But it is not under the UN. Both their headquarters are in the Hague. Okay, and the cases that uh, they handle are, in the case of ICJ, it handles cases between parties. It also gives advisory opinions to specialized agencies of the UN or different countries regarding international law. Okay, whereas in the case of International Criminal Court, it takes care of prosecution of individuals. Which individuals? Those individuals who have been accused of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, crimes of aggression. And over here in this ICJ, the cases which are there are heard are sovereignty based issues, boundary and maritime disputes, natural resources disputes, human rights issues, treaty violations, etc. Now, please also read the funding of ICC. ICC gets funding from uh, all those state parties to the Rome Statute. Rome Statute is the founding law of the ICC. And all those parties which are a part of this uh, Rome Statute provide contributions. Also voluntary contributions from the UN, voluntary contributions from governments, international organizations, individuals, corporations, etc. Okay. Now, what is the ICC? The ICC is nothing but the world's first permanent international criminal court. It investigates uh, and where warranted tries individuals charged with the gravest of crimes, such as those crimes against uh, humanity such as genocide, war crimes, crimes of aggression, etc. The International Criminal Court is located in The Hague and it is governed by the Rome Statute. Okay. Now, the court may exercise jurisdiction in a situation where genocide, crimes against humanity or war crimes were committed on or after only July 2002. The crimes were committed by a state party national or in the territory of a state party or in a state that has accepted the jurisdiction of the court. Only these uh, people can be charged with crimes. Only those uh, countries which are a party to the Rome Statute or those countries in which uh, or those countries in whose territory that particular crime happened and so on. Okay, India is not a party to the Rome Statute along with USA and China. And ICC is intended to complement and it does not replace any national criminal uh, system such as say the Supreme Court. It cannot be replaced by the IC. Rather, it is only there as an additional source. 
only when the national criminal courts don't take sufficient actions against people who are doing all these genocides and all of that in that particular case cases are lodged in the icc and that is when it steps in it is complementary and also when a situation is not within the court's jurisdiction the united nations security council can refer the situation to the icc granting it jurisdiction this has been done in the cases of sudan and libya and all so the icc can always be given cases from the un security council and its jurisdiction can be expanded okay now but it it is always uh, applicable to state parties except when the unsc intervenes and gives a case to the icc okay now the reason why it is in the news is because uh, a lot of people want mr putin who is the russian president to be prosecuted currently moving on telecom regulatory authority of india the reason why it is in the news is because uh, it has been 25 years since this act was enacted and usually upsc has this habit of asking uh, entities which are you know having such a number 25 years 50 years 100 years upsc ask questions from them so please sir uh, let's go through it now what is the tri the tri is nothing but it's a statutory body it was established under the telecom regulatory authority of india act 1997 and it is an independent regulator of the telecom industry like how the rbi is a regulator of the banking industry similarly you have the tri which is a regulator of the telecom industry what are the objectives of tri its mission is to create and nurture conditions for the growth of telecommunications in the country it regulates the telecom services including fixation revision of tariffs for telecom services which were earlier with the central government and now this is an independent body which is there for fixation revision of tariffs it also aims to provide a fair and transparent policy environment which promotes a level playing field and facilitates fair compensation it is also there for ensuring good competition to happen not just fixing of tariffs or fares but it also ensures that competition is maintained and there is growth of telecommunications now before understanding more about tri and the functions of tri we will also see the other uh, we will see the other functions of tri okay now tri can make several recommendations these recommendations can be about the need the need for introduction of a new service provider or it can also make revocation for uh, revocation of licenses the licenses which have given which have been given to telecom companies can be revoked also uh, it uh, provides uh, recommendations about technological improvements in the services which are being provided by the service providers it can recommend new technology to be adopted by the service providers also it ensures uh, the laying down of standards of quality of service to be provided by the service providers it lays down the standards of service which have to be provided by the service providers which are telecom companies like say jio or airtel what are the standards that they have to provide and if at all these standards are not being provided the tri also conducts periodical surveys in order to ensure that these survey, uh, services are provided adequately and if they are not being provided tri also has the powers to impose fines on these companies for not maintaining services okay also please remember that any of the recommendations of the tri are not binding upon the central government in case the tri provides any recommendations to the central government it is not binding on those whereas when it comes to regulating of companies all its verdicts and orders are binding on these companies okay now who are the members the tri consists of one chairperson and two whole time members one chairperson plus two members 
three people and two part time members two part time members all of whom are appointed by the government of india the chairperson and other members shall hold their office for a term of 3 years or till the age of 65 whichever is earlier no also uh, one more thing about the try is that uh you know once if at all the try has decided upon a case and it has given a particular verdict this verdict can be appealed in the td sat telecom dispute settlement and appellate tribunal it's called the td sat hence appeal from try goes to td sat always remember this now moving on the td sat is again it consists of one chairperson and two other members all of whom are appointed by the central government so please remember this also td sat comprises of one chairperson plus two members again these people are appointed by the central government and the try comes under uh, so majorly it comes under the central government itself okay now enactment of the dandi march like what we said it's been 90 years since uh, independence came and hence uh, there has been the enactment of dandi march 81 persons will embark on the same 386 km long foot march from dandi on march 12th to celebrate the 75th anniversary of india's independence gandhi had actually if uh, people remember gandhi had actually made 11 demands before making the dandi march he had demanded for the britishers to reduce expenditure on army and civil services by 50% introduce total prohibition on alcohol carry out reforms in the criminal investigative department to reduce preventive detention and then change arms act allowing popular control of issue of firearm licenses even to indians releasing of political prisoners accepting the postal reservation bill introduce reduce this uh, re- rupee sterling exchange ratio in order to make indian exports more competitive introduce textile production protection okay reserve coastal shipping for indians reduce the land revenue by 50% abolish the salt tax now why did gandhi focus so majorly on salt that is because you know salt was one thing which united all the indians it inter- it united the rich and the poor everyone needs salt in their food it uh, brought together the upper caste and the lower caste upper caste and the lower caste it brought together people in the city and in the rural so this was a very emotive issue which connected to every indian and hence uh, mahatma gandhi ji picked up this issue of salt and it reminded everyone how much on a daily day to day basis the britishers were exploiting them on march 2nd 1930 uh, gandhi informed the viceroy of his plan of action according to his plan gandhi with a band of 78 members from the sabarmati ashram uh, had to march through the villages of gujarat for 240 miles on reaching the coast at dandi the salt law was to be violated by collecting salt from the beach and even before the the full dandi march began thousands of those people you know they started uh, coming to the sabarmati ashram and gandhi also gave many further uh, action action points which the crowd had to do once the uh, salt law was broken wherever there was possible civil disobedience of the salt law should be started which means that salt should the salt law should be broken as much as possible foreign liquor and cloth shops should be picketed we can refuse to pay taxes if we have the enough strength lawyers can give up practice public can boycott law courts government servants can resign from their posts all these should be subjected to truth and non violence he always wanted violence or ahimsa to be a part of his protests local leaders should be obeyed after gandhi's arrest so once Ga- gandhi knew that he will be arrested and hence once he was arrested he held that it is the local leader's voice that the public should follow afterwards now once the satyagraha was done and the salt law was broken 
Gandhi was arrested and he couldn't go to Darsana. So the actual plan was to go to Darsana and to attack the Darsana salt uh, works over there. And hence, in the place of Mahatma Gandhi, it was Sarojini Naidu, Imam Sahib and Manilal Gandhi who went to Darsana and they led a raid on the Darsana salt works during which the unarmed and peaceful crowd was met with a brutal lati charge. Over oh, here, even two people died in this lati charge. Okay, apart from that, in Tamil Nadu, Sri Rajaji led a march from Trichy to Vedarinyam on the uh, Tanjavur coast. This is known as the Koromandal coast. Then in the Malabar region, K. K. Lappan, a Nair Congress uh, leader famed for Vaikom Satyagraha. He was the person who led the Vaikom Satyagraha, organized salt marches. P. Krishna Pillai, the future founder of the Kerala Communist Movement, heroically defended the national flag in the face of police lati charge on the Calicut beach. Okay. In the Andhra region, it was actually pretty low in the Andhra region as compared to the 1920s when you had the Rampa uh, struggle as well, which was led by Alluri Sita Ramaraju. Uh, in the Andhra region, salt marches were organized in West and East Godavari, Krishna and Guntur. A number of Sibirams, which were military style camps, were set up to serve as the headquarters of the salt satyagraha. Similarly, in Orissa under Gopabandhu Chaudhary, salt satyagraha proved to be effective in Balasore, Kattak and Puri. In Assam, okay, again Assam was one of the places where it was pretty silent as compared to 1920s. However, there was a good amount of struggle which started you know, in response to the Cunningham Circular, which was there to ban students from participating in politics. Also, the industrial town of Sholapur for textiles, you know, it saw the fiercest response from Gandhi's arrest. Textile workers went on a strike from May 7th and along with other residents, they burned the liquor shops and other symbols of government authority. So there were several other things that happened in West Bengal, in Bihar, where uh, uh, Chaukidara tax was not being paid. You know, there was a there was proper civil disobedience. Please uh, read more. And basically after this, uh, you know, the British government had to placate Mahatma Gandhi and they had to made a deal they had to make a deal with him. And hence Lord Reading met uh, Gandhi and uh, they came to a compromise. And Gandhi was made to attend the second round table conference. I'm sorry, it was not Lord Reading, I believe. I guess it was Lord Irwin. Please check it once. Uh, but uh, Mahatma Gandhi attended the second round table conference. Though nothing uh, concrete came out of the second round table conference. Now. Moving on, Unified District Information Systems for Education Plus. What is this uh, UDSC? UDSC is a, an annual report. It's a data collection exercise, uh, which is done by the Ministry of Education. Earlier it was conducted by the Ministry of HRD. Now it is conducted by the Ministry of Education. And it has released a detailed report on the Unified District Information System for Education Plus. Now, the UDC Plus system of online data collection from the, from the schools was developed by the Department of School Education and Literacy in the year 2018-19. It was aimed to overcome the issues related to actual practice of manual data filling in paper format and subsequent feeding on computer at the block or the district level in the UDC data collection. Hence, the difference between this UDC data collection and UDC Plus system is that uh, there is more technology which is being used right now. Improvements have been made particularly in the areas related to data capture, data mapping and data verification. Okay, there is proper direct data collection unlike in UDSC where, you know, manual data was collected and later this manual data was entered into uh, computers at the district level. Instead of that, over here in UDC plus, there is a digital set of data collection from the people itself rather than having manual collection. Now, 
moving on what is this uh, report what does it say it says that when it comes to students and teachers in schools students enrolled in school education from primary to higher secondary stood at 25.38 crores now this 25.38 crores is an increase as compared to the 25 crores which was seen in 2019 and 20 now uh now the gross enrollment ratio which means that how many what percentage of the total population in that particular age group are studying so the number of people who are studying by the total population in that age group of that age group and measures the general level of participation has improved in 2020-21 at all levels of school education compared to 2019-20 level wise ger as compared to 2019-20 are 92.2% from 89.7% in upper primary so most of it has increased if you have noticed okay now uh also the number of teachers who are engaged in school education has also increased by about 8800 in comparison with number of teachers in 2019-20 the pupil teacher ratio which means the number of uh, teachers who are there for uh, the number of pupils who are under every single teacher in 2020-21 the pupil teacher ratio stood at 26 for primary and 19 for upper primary 18 for secondary and 26 for higher secondary showing an improvement since 2018-19 so please see this this pupil teacher ratio has improved also in 2020-21 over 12.2 crore girls are enrolled in primary to higher secondary uh, showing an increase of 11.8 lakh girls compared to in 2019-20 and hence in uh, 2019-20 there might have been 12.1 crore uh, no on top of that there is an addition of 11.8 lakh crore. girls who have attended school now most important difference is in the school infrastructure okay so the number of schools with electricity has increased there is you know 58000 schools which have been provided electricity in this last one year also 84% of the total schools have functional electricity as compared to 73% only in 2018-19 in terms of functional drinking water the number of the percentage of schools has increased to around 95% from 93% in terms of functional girls toilet facility it has increased to 93.9% as compared to 93.2% in 2019-20 in terms of functional computers the number of schools have increased to 6 lakhs from 5.5 lakhs showing an increase of 3% also the number of schools with internet facilities has increased to 3.7 lakh from 3.36 lakhs so uh, hence a lot of students from government aided and even from private schools they have shifted over to government schools more than about near about 40 lakh students have done that over the last year this is what the udisc is saying now okay it is again please remember that it is one of the largest uh management information systems on school education in the entire world okay uh this udisc exercise it's one of the largest exercises in the entire world and it was introduced only in 2018 19 in order to speed up the data entry and reduce errors and improve data quality okay it is an application to collect the school details about factors related to a school and its resources so please remember that this was done in a very manual manual fashion and it was only computerized from the district level however this 2020 21 thing has been very digitized it has been updated as compared to the earlier versions it helps us to understand all these uh, educational parameters which exist from class 1 to class 12 in government and in private schools across the entire country it helps us to understand both government as well as private schools like you know here we are seeing that there has been a shift from private schools to government schools okay neutraceuticals 
what are nutraceuticals and why is it in the news okay nutraceuticals uh they are nothing but they it is a broad tr- term which is used to describe any product which is derived from food sources with extra health benefits in addition to the basic nutritional value found in foods like say for example you have milk okay when we drink milk we get calcium however the same milk you know all the nutritional content from this milk is also extracted and it is used to produce say protein powder and hence this protein powder has a concentration it has a concentration of all the health benefits that we can get from milk so new so protein powder is an example of a nutraceutical it is nothing but it is an umbrella term and it is derived from food sources and it provides extra health benefits like say for example a fish oil capsule you can also eat fish okay but when the oil from this fish is extracted and it is provided as a food uh, in the form of a fish oil capsule then it is known as a nutraceutical fish oil capsule now why is it in the news it's because the pradhan mantri jan aushadhi parayojana kendras have added nutraceutical products including protein powder and bars malt based food supplements immunity bars for its customers now they can be considered as non specific biological therapies used to promote general well being control systems and prevent malignant processes okay they are also it combines these two words nutrient and pharmaceutical and helps you know it becomes very clear as to what they are now also please remember that uh, these nutraceuticals are usually dietary supplements they are dietary supplements like yogurt and all of that or they are functional food they can also be medicinal food in order to help a person recover fast like a person who has a torn ligament you know he is advised to eat a lot more of uh, you know certain foods in order to recover from the torn ligament or a person who has brittle bones he is asked to eat calcium sandwich tablets now those are also nutraceuticals so it can also have dietary supplement benefits it can also be medicinal food uh, and it can also be functional food okay now they are non specific biological therapies used to promote general well being okay they are now that is uh, about it